Hey there, and welcome to Southridge Church Online. I'm Anna, the youth pastor at Southridge Church, and we're so glad you're here joining us for our Catalyst service tonight. If you're new to Southridge Church, go ahead and text the word SRC Online, all bunched up together, to the number 304-825-2595. This is going to get you connected with our church, so that when we do get back to services together physically, then you'll already be a step ahead. As we've seen, God has been really faithful, specifically with our giving. Man, God is doing amazing things. And as we move into a time of giving, I just want to say thank you, friends, for continuing to allow God into this part of your life. It can be really difficult. So props to you. Way to go. God is moving. If you choose to give, there are two ways. You can go to src.life giving to give there, 
or if you're watching Southridge Church Online, you can just click the Give tab. Tonight, we're gonna to be hearing a message from Erin Coker. She's on our teaching team, and we are excited to hear what God has put on her heart for us. But before we get to her, let's go ahead and pray. God, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for knowing us. You know us better than we know ourselves. And for that, God, it seems scary, but there's something peaceful about that, Lord. I pray right now that wherever we are, at our homes, in our cars, that you will just reach into our, our hearts and into um, our being. And God, allow us to see you clearly. Allow us to know you more. God, I pray that you be with Erin and allow her to speak the exact truth that you've prepared for her to share. God, you are good and we praise you for that and so much more. In Jesus' name, amen. Coker, thank you for gathering with us tonight at Catalyst. This evening we are going to be in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 2. You can follow along at src.life or follow along in your Bible. But first I want to share a story with you of something that recently happened with our family. Tyler and Molly Markham own a business called Trademark, and one of the things that they do is they buy homes, fix them up, and then resell them. So we wanted to go and look at this one house in particular because it was gorgeous online. So we pull in, and I want to paint a picture of what this house looked like for you. We pull into the driveway. It's wide and long and flat, which for West Virginia is huge, and you can pull into a garage and it was this beautiful Cape Cod home, just like a light yellow. And the front yard was flat and large, and the grass was green, and it was fenced in. And we walked in, and I walked up to the front of the house, and I saw how gorgeous it was. And the door, the front door was huge. Like, I think our whole family could probably walk through it at the same time without shouldering each other. Just a huge front door, and on each side of, of the door there were those lights, and they looked like pineapples. So I affectionately started calling this house the pineapple house, and I fell in love. I walked in, and it just was so gorgeous. Wood floors, the kitchen was redone beautifully, and to the right was the living room. Next to the living room were these French doors that led out to a porch that overlooked the, again, flat, beautiful, fenced-in backyard. And behind the house was not another house that you could see, but woods. And there just was complete solace back there. It was so beautiful and so peaceful. And I started to picture about what that house would look like in the fall and all the changing leaves. And, and there were so many wonderful things about this house, but what I kept saying to my family over and over again is, if we lived here, I would drink coffee on the back porch every day. And I said it over and over and over again. And I started picturing our family living in this house, but I'm a stay-at-home mom, and currently this was not within our means to purchase a house like this. So you know how it is when you see something and you can now envision yourself living there or driving that or wearing that or having that item. And once you can see yourself in that space or having that thing, you can't stop thinking about it until you have it. 
And so this is now where I was. And though we were praying for someone to come and buy this house quickly, I also was like, I really want to drink coffee on this back porch. <laughs> and it's so funny how our minds work as humans, isn't it? So I went to bed that night, woke up the next day, and the house that I once was content in all of a sudden wasn't good enough. And so I was discontented before I even put my feet on the ground that morning. I went downstairs and did the usual thing, make breakfast, coffee, and it's usually over breakfast and coffee where I read my Bible and pray for the day. And I was doing this, picturing I could be on the back porch drinking coffee at this beautiful house, but I'm here at the kitchen table. And God speaks to me in these moments of reading scripture, and he can do that for you too, and I'm sure he has. And what he spoke over me this morning was so profound and so simple. He said, Aaron, if you want to drink coffee on the porch in the morning, why do you have to have the pineapple house to do that? Why can't you do that in the house that you're currently in? And it was like, duh. I should, why did I think of that myself? And it just was that profound moment where I realized, yeah, I don't have to live outside of my means. God has called me to be a stay-at-home mom right now. I don't have to go out and find a job in this moment so that we can move to a house that is similar to this, and I would be living outside of my current calling just so I can drink coffee on the back porch. It just was so silly. But that is where we go as humans. That's just how we think. We see ourselves in a certain situation, and we have to have it. So we max out our credit cards, or whatever, so that we can do that thing that we want to do. And so, but I want to remind us, and what God reminded me that morning is, a lot of the times, the things that you want, you don't have to wait until the if then. Well, okay, I'm going to do that when my body looks like this. Or I can have friends over when I have a kitchen that looks like this. No, you can have friends over, not now, because we're social distancing, but soon. You can go and move your body in a certain way before you look a certain way. You can have a relationship with Christ before, like you can do the things with Jesus that you want to do and you don't have to be perfect. And so that's what I want to remind us of today. We're going to read Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 2 together. We're going to read both verses, and then I'll break it down. It says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. So if I were going to read those two verses in my morning time with the Lord, I would get to verse 2 and see, do not conform to the pattern of this world. And that is so broad that it's easy for me to look over. I would think I'm not conforming to the patterns of this world. You might think you're not conforming to the patterns of this world because you're tuning in on a Wednesday night online. You have kids running rampant all over the place, but you're choosing to be here in this moment. I'm not conforming to the patterns of this world. I read my Bible. I pray. I try to teach my kids how to follow the Lord. I'm not conforming to the patterns of this world. So that's really a broad view. So I want to break it down smaller for us so that we can see, are we maybe not conforming to the patterns of the world, but are we conforming to the patterns of someone else? This world is so distracting, and pretty soon we're going to be together again, and we're going to be distracted by each other. We can look to our right, and we can look to our left, and we can look at our neighbors and scroll through our phone, and we begin to conform maybe to the pattern of our really close friends 
or our neighbors who look like they have it all together. They have those things, that dream job, that dream spouse, dream children, whatever it is that you see to be perfect, and you think, okay, well, maybe that's what I, I need to pattern my life after theirs because they have it together. So what seems to be a good thing, they have it together. They're following Jesus this way. This is how they raise their kids. That's what I'm supposed to do. So now, instead of going to the Lord and seeing what he has for you in your life, we look to our right and to our left, and we start to conform our life, our pattern, after them. But scripture says, do not conform to the pattern of this world. Do not even conform to the pattern of your best friend who might even be following Jesus. Do not conform to that pattern because, why? You were uniquely made. God has given you specific skills and abilities, a personality, the relationships that he has given to you specifically. And when we start to look at other people, we miss out on what he is giving to us. Even my identical twin daughters, who look almost exactly alike, they are unique to each other. God has given them their own personalities. Trust me, they are very different from each other. Their own style. Right now they have the same friends. And it might be hard for them to think that they're supposed to do something different from each other. But God has given each of them their own specific calling. And that is how it is for us. We each have our own calling to go by. Not our friends. Not that person we're looking at on the TV or on our phone. You. You have a calling. Do not conform to the pattern of this world. Moving on in verse 2. But be transformed. Do not conform but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. What does it look like to renew your mind? For me, what it looked like that day that I so desperately wanted to live in a dis different house and have a different situation was to go downstairs and open up my Bible and ask the Lord to renew my mind. What do you have to speak to me today? And it was something laughable, something so simple that I should have thought of on my own. But as the days go on and as we get older, our vision gets clouded. We cannot see as clearly, which is why it's so important to renew your mind daily. And that is actually our bottom line. Renew your mind daily to know his will for your life. And sometimes we have to do this more than once. We have to renew our minds constantly because we are so bombarded by distractions and the way that we think that we are supposed to be living. So do not look to your right or to your left or to your neighbor or to your person, your influencer that you follow on Instagram. But look to the Lord for what he has for your life. Because when we go on in verse 2, it is then that you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. He doesn't want for us to be striving and stressed and strained because we're trying to be somebody else. He has something good and pleasing and perfect for you. And it might look different than what it looks like for everybody else. And that's okay and that's good. But we need to be willing to step out into the unknown, into that difference. So as many of you know, and I am sick of even saying it, we used to work at Camp Marengo. <laughs> and I was a team building instructor. So we would have school groups, universities, leadership teams come in, and we would lead them through these silly team building exercises that seemed small. And when we, when we would give the rules, they seemed very easy and simple, but they were designed to be so frustrating. And if one person made one mistake, the whole group would have to start over. 
Eventually, most of the time, the group would complete the exercise and we would circle up and debrief. And we would talk about that particular exercise and how did they communicate in their frustration? And what did they learn while they were doing this exercise? And what that would do is they would be able to correlate that moment and that exercise and relate it to their organization and how they knew they needed to start working better as a team. And they thought they had communication all together, but now they can see we really need to work on communication. So it's just a way to see where your weaknesses are and how you can build off of each other. This particular exercise involved a hula hoop. And so I'm gonna explain to you the rules and what we would do, okay? So I would say everyone needs to stand really close to each other in a circle, like shoulder to shoulder, and put your index fingers out. I'm going to come and I'm going to put a hula hoop resting on your index fingers. All you have to do, and this is, this is where we get you. We make it sound like it's simple. All you have to do is lower the hula hoop to the ground as a team. No one can take their finger off of the hula hoop. You have to do this together. If any finger comes off of the hula hoop, you have to start over. Get started. Sounds simple enough. So we'd circle up and put our index fingers out, and then I would come along with the hula hoop and rest the hula hoop on their fingers. What happened 100% of the time, 100, this never was different, is when I put the hula hoop on their fingers, the rule was to lower it to the ground. But what they did is they raised it up into the air every single time. And I'd be like, you're supposed to put it on the ground but they would raise it in the air. Why? Because they couldn't take their finger off of the hula hoop. So it would always get raised up and eventually you can only hold your hands this high for so long and everybody's different heights. So whose finger would come off first if I was doing this exercise? Most likely mine. <laughs> and so the finger would get separated and then you would have to start over. If I were going to debrief this exercise, in accordance with this teaching, what I would say is we were each uniquely designed and the hula hoop represents what God has given you. The abilities, the skills, your personality, your finances, everything that you have and everything that you are was given to you by our creator God. And he places it in your hands when you were created, he places those things in your hands. And then what he asks us to do is lay them at his feet. And then that way, when he gives and he continues to give to us, we can then give those things to him and he can use them for his glory. But what happens? He gives us our abilities. He gives us our personalities, our marriages, our kids, everything that we have. And rather than keeping our eyes fixed on him and rather than renewing our minds in Christ, we look to those people that we are shoulder to shoulder with and doing life with. And we look at each other and we raise our hands instead of laying what we have at his feet because we are trying to keep up with each other and we're trying and maybe you've been living like this for so long that you don't even know who you are anymore you don't even know who you are called to be because you've been trying to live like somebody else for so long you can only live like this in this stressed out situation for so long before something has to give, before you have to start over again. That's the reality of it. I want us to ask ourselves today, write this question down and ask yourself this maybe every day this week. Why do I do what I do? Why do I do what I do? Why do I try to live my marriage out like this? 
Why do I try to raise my kids in this way? Why do I live in this house? Why do I drive this car? If your answer, and if you are living like this, instead of like this, if your answer is because I'm looking to somebody else to keep up, it is time to renew your mind, to be transformed, because you are conforming to the pattern of this world. But if you can ask yourself that question and say, I live in this house because God called me to it. I drive this car because it is within our financial means and it, it transports our family to go and do good things for other people. And even for us to enjoy. God has given me the green light. Then enjoy and go and do that and live in peace because you're laying your life at Jesus' feet. You're not conforming to the pattern of this world. And many of us live like this. We're doing like air squats. We're trying to keep up, and then we, okay, now I'm going to lay it down. We're trying to keep up, now I'm going to lay it down. And it's this battle between conforming and fixing our eyes. It is a training exercise. And the more you train to renew your mind, the easier it's going to be to live this way and to live different from the people that you surround yourself with, even if what they're doing is good. But is it what God is calling you to? Ask yourself, why do I do what I do? When we look to the world for the standard, when we look to our friends, we are going to be chasing after the wind. We're going to be stressed out and reaching for something that is unattainable, and you're going to forget who God has called you to be. But we're going to go back to verse 1 in Romans. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, underline, in view of God's mercy, if you are here and you can't do it anymore, you are in view of God's mercy. And all you have to do is say, God, I don't know who I am. I don't know who I am anymore. <laughs> you are in view of God's mercy. And when you transform your mind and you ask him, he will tell you and he'll make you grateful for the things that you have and for the things that he has given you. And you won't be living with maxed out credit cards or debt because you have resigned yourself to living for him. You are in view of God's huge mercy. He has so much mercy for us. Continuing on verse 1, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. What does it look like to offer your body as a living sacrifice? It looks like this. Laying every part of yourself down at his feet and saying, I don't care what everybody else is doing. What do you want for me to do? And then go and do it. That is what it means to live as a living sacrifice. And then continuing in verse 1, this is your true and proper worship. This is your true and proper worship. I cannot wait to get back together on Sundays and Wednesdays and worship through song and to raise our hands and worship to the Lord, but that is not your true and proper worship. I love my mornings with the Lord and reading my Bible and praying to him, but even that is not our true and proper worship. Our true and proper worship is to be a living sacrifice. That means to lay your life at his feet, and when you renew your mind and he speaks to you the will for your life and for your family 
and for your situation, what that means is that you did read your Bible and you listened for him to speak to you and then you went and you actually did it. That is true in proper worship, to actually go and do what he has called you to do. And I'm telling you, we freak out about that. But it's this kind of life that we should be freaking out about because we're not being who we were intended to be. But when we can lay everything down, that is where we find true peace and that is where we find our true and proper worship. You are in view of God's mercy right where you are. You are in view of God's mercy. I want you to fix your eyes on Jesus and don't look to your right or to your left, but have your mind renewed and he is going to speak his will into your life. And we're going to do it. We're going to do it. And we're going to see life change in our families and personally and in our church and in our community. And I cannot wait. Please pray with me. God, thank you for the images that you gave us today to think about and the life that you are calling us to. It's not a life of strain and worry and anxiety and living outside of our means but you have designed a life for us to be joyful and vibrant and doing things for you. God, I pray in your name that we will fix our eyes on you today and that we'll remember who we are and who you designed us to be. In your name, Jesus. Done with the hiding. 
Jesus for that message. Thank you for joining us. If you decided to follow Jesus for the first time tonight or even the first time in a long time, go ahead and text the word Jesus to 304-825-2595. We cannot wait to be with you again. Until then, know that you can still be a part of what God's doing in our community through things like the food drive for Bread of Life Food Pantry. To find out how to get involved in that, make sure you're following us on social media, SRCWV on Facebook and Instagram, or you can give a monetary donation towards Impact Hunger under our giving option at SRC.life. We have one more thing we want you to know about. June 4th, there will be a blood drive at Southridge Church. Stay tuned for more information about that, but mark your calendars. The, our nation is in a desperate need for people to be willing to give in this way. So mark your calendar, June 4th, Blood Drive at Southridge Church. We can't wait to see you next time. Until then, we love you, God bless you, and have a great evening.